Item number, SCP-403, Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures, SCP-403 is to be sealed in a steel safe, with a combination known only by Dr. The walls of the safe must be reinforced with fire retardant material, complying with Foundation Standard C3-403. The safe will remain under surveillance by two armed guards at all times. Description SCP-403 is a visually unremarkable naphtha-fueled lighter that was discovered in a cafeteria at site when lit once after a prolonged period of disuse. SCP-403 produces an ordinary flame. However, if ignited repeatedly within 24 hours, the flame produced by SCP-403 becomes larger and more violent in nature with each subsequent ignition. During an experiment, a Class D test subject attempted to light SCP-403 a third time within two hours, resulting in a powerful explosion of superheated gas and plasma. This event destroyed the monitoring equipment within the testing cell and caused significant damage to the flame-resistant plating lining the walls. Despite this, the subject and the item itself remained virtually unharmed. Radio imaging has shown the formation of a magnetic field around the lighter, which is hypothesized by researchers to be the cause of this immunity. The fuel used by SCP-403 to produce the detonations is not known as of yet, if any conventional fuel is used at all. Examination of the item shows that the fuel compartment within SCP-403 is empty. No traces of any combustible compound have been found. Considering this, and the amount of energy initiations are capable of producing, SCP-403 should be currently treated as if using a functionally inexhaustible power supply. Tests to ascertain the exact nature of this power source are ongoing. Addendum 4031 Continued experimentation has been authorized for SCP-403, and a designated safe detonation area has been provided for testing. After the third ignition, a Class D personnel attempted a fourth, which caused an explosion that initially appeared to be a thermonuclear blast. Evaluation of the explosion has demonstrated that it was of equivalent magnitude to 10 megatons of TNT, far exceeding the yield of most strategic nuclear weapons. This yield was also far greater than extrapolations based on past tests seem to suggest. Further studies of recorded data seem to show that the event was actually caused by the release of data expunged stellar material. No abnormal lasting effects from the explosion were observed, apart from the devastation wreaked by the initial blast. Once again, the subject used to ignite SCP-403 was unharmed by the blast. Addendum 4032 All further tests have been suspended due to the extreme danger presented by the high-energy detonations SCP-403 is capable of producing. As it seems the power of SCP-403 increases exponentially, a fifth ignition could result in an event comparable to data expunged. A blast of this magnitude could devastate vast portions of the continent and present a severe risk of breaching the containment of several Foundation sites, including… Item Number SCP-430 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-430 is to be kept in a humanoid containment cell on Site-17, placed on a wooden pallet or equivalent loose support at least 20 centimeters above ground to prevent rusting. The cell containing SCP-430 is to be fitted with an adjustable table, a sand basin, a controllable two-position hook conveyor system, and a master-slave control system as specified in Document 430 Gamma Construction Details. One cell adjacent to SCP-430 is to house a live D-Class subject, designated SCP-430-C, whose suitability was ensured by enacting Protocol Prometheus-11 prior to their internment. SCP-430-C is to be treated in accordance with Foundation Humanoid Containment Guidelines Section NP-1. Suitable SCP-430-C candidates are non-violent, introverted, and capable of carrying out simple tasks without supervision, 
with claustrophobia being a disqualifying factor. Other cells adjacent to SCP-430 containment are to be designated long-term low-value item storage. The set of cells adjacent to SCP-430 is designated SCP-433. While SCP-430 contains a living subject, designated SCP-432, such SCP-432 is to be treated in accordance with Foundation Humanoid Containment Guidelines, Section NP-5, except as following. Routine medical examinations of SCP-432 are to take place weekly, rather than monthly. SCP-432 is to be fitted with a heart rate monitor. Due to restricted movement, SCP-432 is to be fed an individualized diet, as per recommendations of a qualified member of Site-17 medical staff. SCP-432 is to be administered daily doses of aspirin to prevent vein thrombosis. SCP-432 is to be encouraged to perform light exercise within the limits of SCP-430's allowance. While no Foundation staff is present in the containment cell, SCP-432 is to have control of the table position, the lighting, and the hook conveyor system by means of the slave controller, unless deemed otherwise by staff of clearance 1430 or higher. This controller is to be disabled from the main control panel prior to staff entering SCP-430 containment. SCP-432 is to be explained the functioning of the controls, and be ordered to transport their cell above the sand basin prior to urination or defecation. The sand basin is to be cleaned daily. In the case of SCP-432 expiring, as represented by the lack of signal from SCP-432 heart rate monitor, coupled with visual confirmation, no personnel is to enter SCP-433 until visual feed confirms the presence of former SCP-430-C inside SCP-430. Subsequently, the remains of previous SCP-432 are to be removed from SCP-430 and the new SCP-432 briefed. Protocol Prometheus 11 Prior to being classified SCP-430-C, chosen D-Class personnel is to sign a printed copy of the following document. Note, following Incident 431, personnel are to ensure SCP-430-C has signed the document with their own name. Researcher Eisenberg I hereby of my own will declare that I reject the divine mandate of our monarch, holding them to no more esteem than the lowest of peasants, for all men were born equal, and that I support, and urge my countrymen to rise against feudal tyranny, and fight for freedom, brotherhood, and equality. Undersigned. Description SCP-430 is a cylindrical gibbet approximately 3 meters tall and 0.7 meters in diameter, weighing CA-800 kilograms, composed of an unknown material. SCP-430 resists attempts to obtain bulk material samples, and attempts at indentation testing resulted in hardness values inconsistent with other properties. Vickers indentation test resulted in measured hardness values between 18 to 35 HV5, while subsequent attempt at sampling showed the bulk material being capable of causing significant abrasive wear of the diamond-coated cutting disc. Samples of surface corrosion are obtainable, and are chemically identical to hydrated ferrous oxide. On the lower rim, the numerals 1772 and name, Hans Dreschler, are carved. While SCP-430 is occupied by a living individual, Designated SCP-432, it persists in a passive state. SCP-432 can interact with their environment outside SCP-430, subject to the imposed physical constraints. Even if feasible for their size and dexterity, SCP-432 will deny having the ability to exit SCP-430. If forced to exit, SCP-432 shows signs of mental distress and reappears within SCP-430 within three hours of removal. SCP-432 shows no other anomalous properties or traits. Individuals within direct sight range of SCP-430 form false memories, consisting of alleged reason for SCP-432's presence within SCP-430. 
in the form of a transgression SCP-432 has committed. The memories are consistent among test subjects. When SCP-432 expires, SCP-430 enters active state. During active state, SCP-430 attempts to locate a suitable individual in its vicinity, with a radius of effect expanding by CA 10 meters an hour, with unknown upper limit. Testing aborted after radius of effect exceeded 300 meters. A suitable individual, defined as one who has transgressed against laws and regulations of the Royal City of City Council, valid during the period of 1766 to 1780, and who is within the effective range, will be instantaneously transported into SCP-430 through an unknown mechanism, becoming the next SCP-432. SCP-430 appears to show strong preference for individuals who have committed crimes against church or feudal authority, such as blasphemy, treason, and poaching. Recovery Log SCP-430 was recovered from Western Germany, following a police raid on a compound owned by members of Dyson von Magdalena, or Sons of Magdalene, as a result of witness reports detailing Hans, a member of the task force, appearing inside SCP-430 after attempting to aid its previous occupant, who was wounded in the firefight and subsequently expired. A modified report detailing his death during the operation was published and members of the task force were administered Class A amnestics. Addendum 431 Sons of Magdalene A fringe Christian sect led by a Johann Members of Sons of Magdalene venerated SCP-430 as a living manifestation of God's judgment and considered SCP-432 holy martyrs, usually providing them with drinking water, honey, and insects as a reflection of the fasting of St. John the Baptist. In its original location, SCP-430 hung from the roof, behind the altar of the compound's church, with a sheet of worked sheepskin with the following inscription covering its lower half. For Mary Magdalene was sinful, but she knew of her sin, and repented in the face of our Lord, and was thus blessed. And the scribes and Pharisees who brought her forth and willed to stone her, knew of her sin, but they were sinful and did not know of their own sin, and thus were damned. And Lord Jesus said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And blessed were the men and women, for they learned of their sin, for they have walked the path of salvation. Addendum 432 Incident 431 on date expunged, SCP-430-C failed to appear with an SCP-430 following expiry of then-current SCP-432, even after one hour since event. 153 minutes after event, researcher A. Novikov disappeared from his office, becoming the next SCP-432, with observers citing charges of sedition and less majesty. When interrogated, SCP-430-C admitted to signing the document with researcher A. Novikov's name, claiming to have overheard it from security personnel, and citing, I never signed shit with my own name, and not gonna start now, as a reason. Examination of the signed sheet confirmed this finding. SCP-430-C was terminated on disciplinary charges. Researcher A. Novikov was provided with a computer and continued his work until death. Item Number SCP-432 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-432 is kept in a standard storage area at Sector 25, is to be kept locked at all times, and the key to the lock kept in the adjacent security station under guard by three level three personnel. No other special containment required. Description SCP-432 is a two-door steel storage cabinet, measuring two meters tall by 1.2 meters wide by one meter deep. The exterior of the cabinet is painted matte green and bears no remarkable features, 
except small areas of corrosion and light scratching commensurate with being left exposed to the elements for a long period of time. The doors of the cabinet are fitted with a basic slide bolt and a hasp for a padlock, allowing the door to be secured from outside. The interior dimensions of SCP-432 display significant disparity with the exterior. The doors open into an apparently extra-dimensional space, containing a large labyrinth complex comprised of an as-yet uncharted series of corridors. The walls, floor and ceiling of the corridors, are constructed from heavily rusted steel and adhere to the same height and width scales as the exterior of SCP-432. 2 meters high by 1.2 meters wide. The corridors within SCP-432 are lit at irregular intervals by what appear to be regular household light bulbs, secured to the walls and wire mesh fittings. Many of the bulbs are observed to flicker, and numerous others are burned out or broken. In places, several large gauge steel pipes have been found bolted to the walls of the tunnels. These pipes are notably cold to the touch and contain flowing water, although the source and destination of the pipes and water are unknown. Many of the pipes observed are in obvious need of repair, and leak cold, average of 3 degrees Celsius, water. Analysis of this water has revealed a low oxygen content and trace amounts of iron oxide, but the water is otherwise potable. The exact size of the labyrinth complex to which SCP-432 connects cannot be accurately measured, as each time the doors of the cabinet are closed and then reopened, the entrance created by the cabinet apparently moves to a different section of the maze. The fate of personnel within the maze when the door is closed is unknown, although remains discovered within the maze suggest starvation is a likely outcome. Other remains coupled with additional evidence gathered during exploration, suggests that the labyrinth contains a large predatory inhabitant of indeterminate species, hereafter known as SCP-432-1. GPS units used within SCP-432 are rendered useless, as are cellular phones. Remote control devices sent into SCP-432 are similarly impaired and cease to function after traveling an average of 20 meters into the maze, rendering remote mapping of the internal layout impossible. High-gain radio transmissions can be used to keep in contact with the personnel within the labyrinth, although significant interference occurs deeper into the maze. If the doors of the cabinet are closed, then all forms of contact with personnel within SCP-432 are severed. Additional Notes SCP-432 was discovered in an abandoned industrial complex in the UK. It came to the attention of the Foundation after Dr. T. Small heard reports of several homeless persons in the area disappearing after staying in the complex. Upon investigation, Dr. Small discovered the cabinet at the center of an abandoned steel mill, surrounded by a number of sleeping bags, bags of clothing, and other personal effects suggesting a number of homeless persons had recently made camp there. SCP-432 was unlocked, but the door closed upon discovery. After exploring the immediate area beyond the entrance, Dr. Small exited SCP-432 and summoned Foundation personnel to transport the cabinet to Sector 25 for analysis. Currently, expeditions have been sent into SCP-432 to attempt to chart its internal geography. To date, several D-Class personnel have been lost within the maze. No further expeditions may be made without express permission of at least two Level 4 personnel. Paint samples, metal fatigue, and construction techniques date SCP-432 to having been constructed in the early 1950s. However, Artifacts recovered from within SCP-432 have been accurately dated to much earlier periods. Expeditions Below are the expeditions within SCP-432 to date. The Standard Agreed Mission Equipment Pack, agreed by Dr. T. Small and Dr. is One hand torch, flashlight, with a three-hour lifespan, and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours. One headset microphone linked to control. 
one shoulder-mounted video unit set for wireless transmission, two 0.5-liter bottles of water, two high-calorie energy bars, eight sticks of luminous marker chalk, SCP-432 Expedition 1. Date. Expunged. Expedition Supervisor. Dr. T.S. Subject is D-64502. Male. Average physique. Subject's background shows history of aggravated assault and burglary. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing a short corridor constructed from the same rusted, corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. The floor is formed from ridged safety steel, as might be found on industrial walkways or gantries. The corridor makes a 90-degree turn to the right, approximately 5 meters ahead of the subject. Control asks the subject to move around the corner. Subject moves forward as requested, turning the corner into a longer tunnel, the exact length of which cannot be judged due to lack of lighting. A conventional electric bulb on the wall lights the immediate area, but the light fails to illuminate much beyond 3 meters. Further lights can be observed ahead, though they only illuminate patches of the tunnel. Control instructs the subject to turn on his torch, and the lighting is notably improved to the limit of the torch's beam. Approximately 20 meters. Control asks the subject to proceed down the tunnel. After approximately 42 meters, a crossroads appears in the tunnel. D-64502 asks Control which way to go and Control tells the subject to pick a tunnel. The subject chooses to go left and, before entering the new tunnel, produces a stick of marker chalk from the equipment pack and draws a large arrow on the wall, indicating the direction of the exit. As subject moves into new tunnel, Control notes that video quality has begun to degrade, with visible interference appearing on the monitors. Control does not inform the subject of this. Subject proceeds down new tunnel for 11 meters before tunnel T-junctions left and right. Subject takes the left tunnel, again marking the direction back to the exit with chalk, and continues onwards. Subject walks approximately 5 meters down the tunnel then stops, and asks Control if they heard anything. Control replies they did not, and asks what D-64502 heard. Subject is quiet, as if listening then replies in muted tones that he can hear someone banging on the wall in the distance and shouting. Subject becomes agitated and tells Control the person sounds f***ing scared. Control boosts audio gain on the subject's camera and pick up sounds similar to the subject's description. Repetitive distant banging, consistent with someone striking a metal surface with their arm or hand. A voice can be detected but audio quality is not sufficient to discern words. Subject is becoming increasingly agitated by the sounds. Control informs the subject to move in the direction of the shouts. The subject objects, but after a short discussion with Control about the nature of his employment, he moves forward. After approximately 14 meters, the tunnel turns 90 degrees right and angles downwards in a gentle slope. Video interference is now noticeably increased, and slight audio interference is now audible. Subject has begun breathing heavily and muttering under his breath. Subject continues down the tunnel for approximately 27 meters until the floor levels out again. The subject abruptly stops, crouches, and swears. Control asks why he has stopped. The subject remains silent, but breathing has become louder and heavier. Control asks again why the subject has stopped, and D-64502 replies he heard a scream and that the banging and shouting has suddenly stopped. Control informs the subject to stand and move forward, but the subject becomes agitated and demands to be allowed to leave. After several minutes of arguing, the subject stands, 
takes a long drink from one of the bottles of water and moves forward again, although slowly. Ahead, the tunnel T-junctions left and right, and Control tells the subject to go right. Subject marks the way back to the exit with chalk and goes right. The tunnel ends in a dead end after six meters. Control informs the subject to go back to the junction and take the left tunnel. This too ends in a dead end after only four meters. Subject seems to have calmed slightly and suggests returning to the previous T-junction and trying the other tunnel. Control confers with Dr. who decides to recall the subject and analyze the data collected so far. The subject has been within SCP-432 for exactly 37 minutes at this point. Control informs the subject to return. The subject moves back through the tunnels, following his chalk marks towards the exit. At crossroads, the subject freezes again and asks Control if they heard a noise. Control confirms that they are detecting a sound, but requests D-64502 explain what he is hearing. Subject identifies the noise as wind. At this point, the camera captures a small drift of what appears to be dead leaves blown from the right-hand unexplored tunnel. Subject remarks that the breeze smells stale. Control informs the subject to collect several leaves for analysis and then proceed down the right-hand tunnel to locate their source. Subject collects leaves and complains about orders to remain in SCP-432, but moves towards the tunnel mouth. As subject nears the tunnel entrance, a loud echoing roar is heard over the audio, similar to a large animal such as a bear or lion. Subject panics, screams, and runs for the exit ignoring Control's demands to investigate the sound. Subject sprints to the exit and collapses in the storage area. Expedition is aborted, the door closed and locked, and Subject removed for debriefing. SCP-432 Expedition 2 Date Expunged Expedition Supervisor Dr. T.S. Subject is D-6411 Female, 32, average physique. Subject's background shows an incident of attempted murder. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a three kilogram weight placed inside the doorway with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates showing subject is in a long corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. Light from the open door behind the subject, coupled with the illumination provided by the bulbs located at irregular intervals on the walls of the structure, lights the tunnel for approximately 20 meters. More lights are visible further down the tunnel, but are very dim. Control requests subject turn on her torch and move into the structure. Subject complies. The passage continues for approximately 100 meters from the entrance until it ends in a T-junction, leading left and right. Subject asks Control which way to go, and is told to go right. D-6411 marks the route back to the exit with marker chalk, and proceeds down the tunnel for 50 meters, until a crossroads is reached. Control informs Subject to take the left-hand branch and subject marks the tunnel wall and enters the indicated passageway, which is followed for 47 meters until another crossroads is reached. Control notes interference to both the video and audio feeds has begun to appear, but is currently negligible. Subject pauses to drink from one of her bottles of water and marks her route back before selecting, without permission from Control, the right-hand branch. Control admonishes D-6411 but allows her to continue. The passageway makes a 90 degree turn left after 18 meters, then continues straight for approximately 73 meters. Ahead of the subject appears another crossroads, but as the subject nears it she freezes and reports that she can hear a rhythmic banging coming through the walls. Control boosts audio gain on camera and the sound is picked up. The banging lasts for 73 seconds before it stops. Subject has remained still while listening, attempting to breathe quietly. 
Control prompts the subject to mark the tunnel wall and proceed left. The subject remains motionless and makes several inquiries into the nature of SCP-432 and the source of the banging. Control firmly reiterates their commands, and subject resumes walking, taking the left tunnel as indicated. Subject has traveled for almost 150 meters when she stops and aims the camera at the left wall of the tunnel. She observes that all of the light fittings in this stretch of the structure have been broken. Shards of broken bulb are visible scattered across the floor. Subject continues forward, remarking that she has begun to detect a faint, unpleasant odor. When asked to describe said odor, D-6411 replies, Something dead. After a further 24 meters, the subject notices an object in the tunnel ahead and moves towards it. Video quality is now beginning to severely degrade. Camera angle tilts as subject kneels to examine the object, and Control asks subject to explain what she has found. Subject explains the object is a left sports shoe. The camera zooms in on the object, while the subject illuminates it with her light source. Camera view tilts again as subject suddenly looks down at the floor of the tunnel and emits a loud expletive. The floor of the tunnel is covered with a large quantity of dried brown residue that crackles and flakes as the subject moves her feet. Sprays of the residue are observed dried onto the walls. The subject remarks that the substance is apparently the source of the odor, and she surmises it is dried blood. The camera tracks several large smears of the substance leading away from the pool up the corridor. Subject's breathing is becoming slightly panicked. Control requests the subject collect the shoe and a sample of the substance for analysis. Subject does so, although complains continuously about the smell and expresses wishes to exit SCP-432. Her requests are denied, and Control orders the subject to continue onwards. Subject continues down the corridor at a much decreased walking speed and is becoming agitated. Camera view changes repeatedly as subject begins looking over her shoulder at erratic intervals. Video and audio feed are beginning to become severe, and Control asks subject to halt while they confer with Dr. Dr. decides to recall the subject, who is now becoming extremely panicked, complaining of hearing footsteps behind the wall to her right. Control boosts audio, but interference prevents confirmation of subject observations. Dr. confirms the expedition is over, and Control recalls the subject, who begins moving back towards the exit at increasing speed. Subject's egress from SCP-432 is unremarkable, except for Subject's increasing speed as she nears the exit. Once out of SCP-432, the door is closed and locked, and Subject sent for debrief. SCP-432 Expedition 3 File locked. SCP-432 Expedition 4 Date Expunged Expedition Supervisor Dr. T.S. Team is made up of three members. D-5891, male 27, D-8321, female 32, and Technical Assistant K. Equipment pack for this expedition differs from norm. Each member carries one hand torch with a three-hour lifespan and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours, one headset microphone linked to control, two 0.5-liter bottles of water, two high-calorie energy bars. Subject D-5891 is equipped with ten sticks of luminous marker chalk, one 250-millimeter steel pry bar, Subject D-8321 is equipped with one shoulder-mounted video unit set for wireless transmission. Technical Assistant K is equipped with one standard-issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 20 rounds of ammunition, one back-mounted oxyacetylene cutting torch. Subjects have been briefed that they are to enter SCP-432, move a short distance into the structure, and then attempt to cut through the interior walls with the oxyacetylene torch. Camera is activated, and team enters SCP-432. 
The door is held open by a three kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing team is in a long corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. Light from the team's torches illuminates the tunnel for approximately 30 meters. The team moves into the structure, with D-5891 marking their progress every few meters with luminous chalk. After several turnings, chosen by control at random, the team arrives at a crossroads. Attached to the wall of the northern passageway are two large steel pipes. The team is asked by control to examine these pipes. K places a hand on one pipe and remarks that it is very cold to the touch and that there is a sensation of liquid moving within the pipe. K requests to cut into the pipe, but Control denies the request, directing the team to follow the pipes instead. Team moves north from the crossroads, following the pipes for almost 300 meters, taking several turnings in the process until the pipes continue through the wall of a dead end. Control informs the team that they should ignite the oxyacetylene torch and cut through the dead end. At this point, K moves to the fore and lights the torch. D-5891 takes up position behind him with the pry bar ready, and D-8321 moves back to cover the other two with the camera. K cuts into the wall, attempting to excise a hole large enough to step through. As he begins cutting, D-8321 remarks that she believes she heard a noise behind them. The camera angle changes as she looks over her shoulder, revealing the corridor behind the team to be empty. Control requests she turn back and film the cutting. Kay has made an approximately one meter high cut into the wall when D-8321 remarks again that she can hear something moving close by and begins looking around. D-5891 and Kay appear not to hear her over the sound of the oxyacetylene torch. K finishes the vertical cut and then proceeds to make a short horizontal cut to allow D-5891 to insert the pry bar and pull out a section of the metal wall. As D-5891 steps forward and inserts the pry bar into the cut, a loud roar is heard, apparently coming from behind the wall. D-8321 screams and begins to back away, at which point... The cut section of wall is seen to bend outwards, pushed by something from behind. At this point the video feed becomes confused, as D-8321 attempts to flee and the camera is unable to compensate for her rapid movements. Audio transmission is unreliable due to the interference and screams of the team. It appears that a large indigenous life form came through the hole cut out by K and assaults the team. Gunfire can be heard, presumably from K's sidearm, along with screams from D-8321 and D-5891. The audio logs also record a loud bellowing, which is currently unidentified, but presumed to be made by the life form. Video stills reveal that data expunged. Subject D-8321 manages to return to the entrance of SCP-432, injured and in a state of extreme mental distress. She exits SCP-432 and, before technical staff can stop her, pulls out the weight holding the door open and shuts SCP-432. When the door is reopened, the internal layout has changed and D-5891 and technical assistant K are assumed lost. Subject D-8321 is removed for debrief, after which, she is terminated. During debrief, it is discovered that a large tuft of animal hair is caught in the harness of D-8321's equipment pack. The hair is removed for analysis. SCP-432 Expedition 5 Date Expunged Expedition Supervisor Dr. T.S. Subject is D-8887 Male 19 Athletic physique. Subject's background shows a history of gang violence and murder. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated and subject enters SCP-432. 
The door is held open by a 3 kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing subject is in a short corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432, which terminates in a T-junction after approximately 10 meters. Tunnel is notable to previous expeditions in that there are no lit bulbs on the walls. As subject moves forward, he remarks that there is a large quantity of broken glass on the floor of the tunnel. Subject switches on his torch and proceeds forward to T-junction, then proceeds left as instructed by control after marking his route. Subject moves through SCP-432, taking turns as indicated by control. During this time, the subject is careful to mark his route using marker chalk and makes routine reports to control, describing any visual or audio impressions of the structure. Subject reports that he can hear occasional, distant machine noises through the walls, and that the interior of SCP-432 is quite cold. After 45 minutes, subject has traveled approximately 2,500 meters through the structure. Video and audio interference is minimal, and Subject has carefully marked his route through SCP-432 with marker chalk. So far, all the wall-mounted light bulbs observed in this section of the structure have been broken. Subject stops to take a drink from a bottle of water and consume a ration bar. After resting for a few minutes, Subject continues and, after taking a turning to the right, encounters three objects on the floor of the tunnel. Subject stops and illuminates the objects with his torch, revealing them to be two crumpled food cans and one bent tin fork. The cans are partially corroded and seem to be quite old. The labels are of a familiar brand of canned beans. Control asks the subject to place the items in his equipment pack for analysis. Subject continues onwards, but after 40 meters stops and informs Control he can hear something. Control requests clarification, and D-8887 remarks that he can hear a faint sobbing or crying emanating from somewhere nearby. Control asks if the crying is male or female, and subject responds that it sounds male. Audio pickup fails to register the sound clearly. Subject is currently stood at a T-junction, and Control instructs D-8887 to move in the direction of the crying. Subject takes the left-hand passageway, moves 30 meters down the connected corridor, takes a right turn, and follows the corridor another 22 meters, proceeds straight ahead at a crossroads, and continues for 37 meters. Video interference has begun to increase, and control cautions the subject not to proceed too quickly. Subject complains the darkness within SCP-432 is hampering his efforts, then shouts, Hello? Can you hear me? I'm coming! Control admonishes D-8887 for shouting, informing him he may attract attention to himself. Subject asks, What else is in here then? But Control informs the subject to continue along his current route and locate the source of the crying. Subject stops at the next junction and pauses to listen. Audio picks up a drawn-out moan or scream apparently human in origin, after which the crying ceases. Subject swears and asks if they heard the scream, stating it sounded very close. Control asks Subject to proceed forward, and Subject complies although slowly, attempting to move with as much stealth as possible. After 20 meters, the passageway turns right. Subject moves around the corner cautiously, the camera reveals the passageway ends in a dead end. Subject approaches the wall and places an ear against the metal. Subject backs away from the wall hurriedly, hissing expletives. Control asks what he heard, and Subject whispers, There's something behind the wall. I can hear it crunching on something. Subject makes repeated whispered requests to exit SCP-432 immediately. Control confers with Dr. S who agrees to recover the subject. Control confirms the subject may begin retracting his route, which he does so at an increased pace. Subject's egress from the structure is uneventful, although subject keeps looking over his shoulder 
and requires repeated verbal encouragement from control to prevent the onset of panic. Subject returns from SCP-432 after a total expedition time of 1 hour and 47 minutes and is sent for debriefing. SCP-432 materials recovered. All documents contained in this file are Class II clearance, requiring two signed approvals to access. All of the following items have been recovered from within SCP-432 during the expeditions to date. Leaves Discovered on Expedition 1. 12 leaves in total. 3 oak, 4 ash, 2 rowan, and 3 maple leaves. All leaves are dry and crumbling and exhibit signs of extreme age. Footwear Recovered on Expedition 2. A single left sports shoe, made from rubber and canvas with the logo on the ankle. The branding and manufacturing style dates the shoe to 1982. The shoe shows signs of heavy use. Frayed laces, worn soles and scuffed toes, and is caked in a fine layer of earth and rust. Dried blood. Recovered on Expedition 2. Scrapings from a large dried blood stain. Tests have confirmed the blood is human, male, type O positive. The blood is too old and degraded for DNA reconstruction. Animal hair. Recovered on Expedition 4. A large tuft of matted brown animal fur with a large clump of skin cells attached to the roots. The hairs are approximately 13 centimeters long, stiff and coarse, and smell extremely unpleasant. DNA analysis has placed the creature in the order family, although noticeable irregularities in the DNA profile exist, suggesting data expunged. Food tins and fork. Recovered on Expedition 5. Two crushed and empty cans of baked beans with meatballs and one tin fork. The cans have apparently been opened with a church key type can opener, and the contents consumed. Dried residue confirms the contents of the cans to have been baked beans with meatballs. One can contains traces of human blood mixed with a food sauce, as well as small traces of human tissue. The blood and tissue is mixed with the food sauce in a manner to suggest it was added to the food prior to consumption. The fork is stamped from tin and of a manufacturing style consistent with 1940s army issue mess kits. It is bent and scratched in places as commensurate with extended use. The tines of the fork are covered with dried food sauce, consistent with baked beans with meatballs, as well as traces of human blood and tissue. Item Number SCP-436 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-436 must be closed at all times, except for testing purposes. It is stored in a large unlocked room to avoid misplacing the item. Personnel below level 3 are not allowed to enter the room. Once per week, SCP-436 will be moved to a nearby identical chamber to allow the floor to be reconstructed. Description SCP-436 is a small locket, apparently made from gold. When opened, an inlaid photograph can be seen. It is unknown if the photograph is the source of SCP-436's effect, because this cannot be tested. All measurements within a certain distance of SCP-436 will be affected by significant error. There is no observed pattern to the amount of error. It seems to constantly change though this cannot be verified because it requires a time measurement. This issue is common to many aspects of SCP-436. The range cannot be reliably determined, the intensity of the error effect cannot be verified, and its location is often vague. It is known, however, that the error effect extends towards its own nature. To clarify, a measurement is required to learn anything about the error effect and this measurement will have an error. The actual dimensions of an object will be permanently affected, even after removal from SCP-436's range. Lids on containers cease to fit properly. Level objects tilt, and measurement devices in particular will warp. 
Individuals affected by SCP-436 will have their height and weight altered, and in some cases, their personality. Ability to learn, perform calculations, and make judgments will be impaired. Medical conditions, such as data expunged, and in particular cancer, have occurred. Long-term exposure to SCP-436 allows the alterations to accrue, eventually resulting in an often indescribable item. Dr. possesses three samples, currently under study. When SCP-436 is closed, the error effect apparently decreases in intensity, although, as previously mentioned, this cannot be confirmed. Attempting to average many measurements affected by SCP-436 will not result in a more accurate measurement. Note that these are not isolated instances of the effect. The measurements simply average to a significant deviation. With multiple averages from multiple sets of trials, the result still does not gain any accuracy. It is unknown how SCP-436 produces this multi-layer effect without Addendum when handling SCP-436, leave it in a flat, open place. We usually have trouble finding it again when personnel leave it in a container, and when we do, it's not easy to open. Dr. Item Number SCP-449 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures all instances of SCP-449 are to be stored in a standard containment vault outside of testing. To minimize additional production, between 3 and 5 kilograms of SCP-449-A will be available for testing in a low-risk chemical storage container. Excess SCP-449-A generated in testing of SCP-449 must be incinerated. A network of D-Class spaced no closer than 1,500 kilometers apart are to consume one grain of SCP-449-A per day to monitor for use of SCP-449. Should use by parties other than the Foundation be detected, agents are to follow the Dragnet procedure outlined in Document 4495 to locate and confiscate the SCP-449 instance. Description each instance of SCP-449 is a twisting aluminum cone, loosely resembling a cornucopia. Each is 40 centimeters long with a mouth approximately 15 centimeters in diameter, weighing slightly more than a kilogram. On the side of each is stamped the word JOY. For unknown reasons, all instances tarnish very easily. When squeezed by a human, SCP-449 instances produce SCP-449-A. The user may control the rate of production by thought, ranging from single grains to about 6 liters per second. SCP-449-A is a clear, crystalline substance resembling sand in texture. It may be shaped, crushed, or dissolved in water or alcohol, though not in bodily fluids other than blood. It is odorless and tasteless. Eating large quantities of SCP-449-A may cause erosion of tooth enamel, damage to the elementary lining, and diarrhea or vomiting, consistent with the consumption of other abrasive substances. If consumed in any quantity, it causes the consumer to enter a stage of extreme pleasure and euphoria for up to a day, as long as it remains within the digestive tract. This effect is not modulated by dosage, and takes effect immediately. SCP-449-A is neither digested nor externally damaged by its passage through the alimentary canal, though when excreted or removed through other means, it no longer exhibits anomalous properties. The euphoric effects of SCP-449-A cease immediately if any person within approximately 1300 kilometers has more SCP-449-A by mass within their digestive tract. To date. All individuals SCP-449 instances have been recovered from had gone to extreme lengths to retain the effects of SCP-449-A, including killing at least four other users of SCP-449, permanently residing in a boat far away from any population centers, undergoing radical gastric surgery to add an additional estimated three cubic meters to their digestive tract. In almost all cases, the SCP-449 users had abandoned activities other than producing and consuming SCP-449-A. 
To date, 83 instances have been recovered out of an estimated 100. Addendum 449-2 Several SCP-449 instances were accompanied by the following note. Joy from the factory. Any will let you have joy. Interferes within 761 miles. Very unfortunate, regrettable, apologies, etc. Happy way for you to be one to feel joy. Joy, joy, joy. Better than joy. As much joy as you like. How much joy to have joy, how much to have sorrow without joy. You cooperate, you defect, you organize, you destroy. You use. Factory only provides. Item number. SCP-463. Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-463 is to be maintained in the small glass display case within its containment cell at site If SCP-463 must be transported from its current location, it should be transported in its display case or some other container. At no time should any Foundation researchers come into direct physical contact with SCP-463. Following the incident of date expunged, personnel are strongly discouraged from bringing food of any sort into SCP-463's cell. Description SCP-463 is a small silver spoon, approximately 17.5 centimeters in length, with a mass of approximately 153 grams. Unless handled by a human, SCP-463 displays no abnormal behavior. Neutron imaging, MRI, and the imaging system have revealed no detail to the inner structure. All analysis of SCP-463 is consequently limited to its directly observable effects. Any individuals who pick up SCP-463 have their spines bent backwards at a 90 degree angle, just below the T6 thoracic vertebra. This bending typically proves fatal although some test subjects have survived with full lower body paralysis. Its effects on humans is displayed regardless of whether or not the subject is wearing gloves, oven mitts, or any other such barrier. The only apparent requirement for SCP-463 to be able to bend its holder is that the subject have a firm grip. Subjects who held SCP-463 very weakly, i.e. with just the tips of the fingers, have been unaffected. Testing has demonstrated that SCP-463 displays no unusual effects when in contact with autonomous machines, remotely controlled machines, animals, or corpses. Addendum. It is the opinion of Dr. that SCP-463 does not actually physically bend the user, but has somehow been embedded with a psychic trigger, which causes the user's back muscles to violently contract. This would explain the absence of SCP-463's effect when handled by non-humans. Memo. See testing logs. Dr. Testing log. SCP-463-1. 30125. Subject D-4221 is placed in proximity to SCP-463's unlocked container. Subject D-4221's back muscles were surgically removed from his body during surgery for spinal stenosis. 30153. Subject D-4221 is instructed to pick up SCP-463. 30158. Subject experiences bending of the upper spine. 30206. Subject goes into neurogenic shock. 30248. Subject declared clinically dead. Body removed from testing site. Testing Log SCP-463-2 4-15-39 Subject D-4279's wheelchair is placed in proximity to SCP-463's unlocked container. Subject D-4279 has already had a complete fracture of the C5 vertebra and has no neuromuscular connection to any muscles below the neck. 4-15-51 Researcher Using tongs Places SCP-463 in D-4279's hand. 4-15-53. Subject experiences non-fatal bending of the upper spine. 
Minor injuries are sustained as a result of falling from wheelchair. 41558. Subject removed from testing site. Testing log SCP 463 3. 44543. Subject D-5119 is placed in proximity to SCP-463's unlocked container. Subject D-5119 has been paralyzed below the waist by prior interaction with SCP-463. 44548. Subject becomes highly agitated and attempts to remove herself from the testing chamber. 44559. An armed guard is called into the testing chamber to ensure compliance of D-5119. 44639. Subject D-5119 is instructed to pick up SCP-463. Subject does not comply. 44645. Subject D-5119 is instructed to pick up SCP-463. Subject does not comply. 44656. Subject D-5119 is instructed by the armed guard to pick up SCP-463. 44710. Subject experiences non-fatal bending of the spine about the T6 thoracic vertebra. No further injuries are sustained. 44720. Subject removed from testing site. Memo. It would seem that SCP-463 does indeed exert a direct force on the user's spine. Sadly, we have absolutely no clues as to the nature of the force. We don't even know what the net torque is. I think the next course of action should be to test SCP-463 on personnel from whom the spinal column itself has been removed. Further testing is clearly in order. Doctor- Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.